Good morning, people of God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship this day. We're pleased that you've gathered with us either in person or virtually. And we know that the Holy Spirit calls us together when we are in community together. This Sunday's readings are the startling pictures of the nature of sin. And the church's repeated celebration of the Holy Communion meal, which we will celebrate together today, just reminds us that the death of Christ is that that is the promise that we are each given. It's this declaration of how God, how much God has done for us and how much God loves each one of us. And all are welcome to come and to receive and to remember that gift and that promise. Before we join our voices together in our opening words of faith, let us just take a moment to close our eyes, to gently breathe in, and to breathe out, and to prepare our hearts for the Spirit to enter in. invite you to rise in body or spirit as we join our voices together in the words from Psalm 22. O Lord, we will declare your name in the midst of the congregation. You are faithful, and we put our trust in you. The Lord welcomes the old and the young, the rich and the poor. The Lord hears us when we cry out, and shall eat and be satisfied. We will lift our voices in praise, saying, May your mercy endure forever. And all all the ends of the earth shall hear our praise and turn to the Lord. We shall all come and bow down before the ruler of the nations. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit that we may confess your Son, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear the promised word. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, Your sins are forgiven. May the Almighty God strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Thanks be to God. shine you people Christ the Lord has entered our human story God is 
and prayers against the darkness hurling to grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. And let us pray. O Lord God, we bring before you the cries of a sorrowing world. In your mercy, set us free from the chains that bind us, and defend us from everything that is evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, the 65th chapter. The prophet announces God's impatience. The people's self-absorption is idolatry, and images of practices that displease God fill this reading. Like a vintner who crushes the grape to release the wine, God will save, use Israel's exile to establish a new community of the faithful. Beginning with the first verse. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps. Their inequities and their ancestors' inequities together, says the Lord, because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions." Thus, says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster, and they say, Do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servant's sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from the book of Galatians, the third chapter. For Paul, baptism is a powerful bond that unites people not only with God, but with other believers. Those who call themselves children of God experience a transformation that removes prejudices of race, social class, or gender in favor of true unity in Christ. Beginning with the 23rd verse. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. 
And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Word of God, word of life. Before we sing our gospel acclamation, I just want to set up what's going to be happening after the gospel acclamation. Uh, First of all, thank you so much for Pastor Charles and Anita uh, Jackson for being with us in worship today. They are our missionaries through World Mission Prayer League, and we have followed you almost literally around the world as a congregation. And they are so appreciative of how Christ has led them and led our mission together and, uh, and us being able to support them in prayer and other ways as well. And so um, in the uh, sermon message time today, uh, Pastor Charles is going to be sharing uh, more about their uh, experiences and those types of things. And so with that in mind, um, just want to let them to know that we continually pray for you and the world's uh, needs that you are helping to serve in your mission itself. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our gospel acclamation. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Lifted me, Satan had me bound. Jesus lifted me, Satan had me bound. Jesus lifted me, Satan had me bound. Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. That's kind of a gospel acclamation song, isn't it? We, this is, when the gospel is read, that's the kind of feeling we should be getting, a little bit of a dance, even if we are Norwegian Lutherans. <laughs> the gospel reading from Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. Je- Jesus, inc- Jesus' mission includes foreigners and his authority extends to the casting out of demons. Some who witness Jesus' work are seized with confusion and fear, but the man who was healed is commissioned to give testimony to God's power, mercy, and power. Verse 26. Then they arrived at the the country of the uh, Gerizines, which is opposite Galilee, and he stepped out on land. A man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and would be driven by the demons into the wilds. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there were on the hillside a large herd of swine which was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what happened, they ran off and told it to the city and in the country. And the people came to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the uh, Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, 
we turn to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you will give me your words to speak this morning. Christ, you will be that word which goes forth to our hearts. Spirit, you will take that word and make us alive today, this week, indeed until you return. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much for not only the introduction, but the introduction of today's worship service. This is a powerful text, and this is why we do what we do. We share the gospel message. This is the gospel message. This is the return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. That kind of be should be speak to our hearts every Sunday. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. How many of you get that feeling when you come to church every Sunday that God has done something? You know what? Probably not all of us, not all the time. Many ways, we see ourselves, we come to church sometimes maybe a little bit like the man in the gospel text. We come, I'm going to say, with a thousand monkeys on our back. With a thousand voices telling us what we need to do, what we need to say. To the point, if somebody asked us our name, the voices speak out rather than us. I, I question when Jesus asked the man, or asked, what is your name? We, we often say, oh, he's legion, and he was talking to the demons. I think he was talking to the man. He was concerned about the man. And the demons spoke louder. Have we lost our identity in the world we live in? Or is our identity swallowed up by what we think we need to respond to on our Facebook or our Instagram post. What we think others should feel about us. This is where we speak into. This is where we speak into that God has spoken to our identity. That God has told us who we are. This is the gospel message. That God has made you, knows you, and loves you, and wants to take the thousand monkeys off your back. This is the message that we proclaim. In World Mission Prayer League this last year, like most of us, it's been a tumultuous year. For us, uh, one of the things that's, um, actually it was 10 months ago, pretty much to the day around this time, we had people who were leaving, uh, I'm going to say Central Asia, because I want to be careful who I measure, but it's not hard to imagine which Central Asian country I'm talking about when they had to be lifted by a U.S. air transport mom and dad and their one-year-old baby. Before that, we'd had another couple who had gotten out the week before because they had left the countryside. So you know which country where we're talking about. And as they were fleeing, their hearts were broken for the friends they were leaving behind, like many of our soldiers were. Our hearts were broken for the people we made and say, we can't leave them there. And what has bothered them and some of us is how we have demonized the people who have, some of the people who've remained in that country. We said, oh, those people are the bad people. Look at what they're doing to their own people. Boy, what could we do? And we have demonized them and we've forgotten that they are being driven by their own demons. They are being driven by their own struggles to find identity. Do you know the history of the Taliban? Do you know where the Taliban came from? The Taliban came, this, it breaks my heart when I tell the story. The Taliban came when, the Rus when Russia in in invaded this Central Asian country and killed so many of the men. And the boys had no fathers, so they ran across the border. And the imams on the other country, and the country beside them, took them and radicalized them and weaponized them because they were searching for dads. This is Father's Day. The world needs men who will stand up and love their sons and their daughters, 
who will love the boys and the girls across the street who don't have dads. Not that we will weaponize them to do our bidding. This is the nature of the law of the, we're driven by, we want to say, this is what God wants. The law says, this is what God wants. And we try to make others to say, this is what God wants from you. And we try to write down the law and we say, so we're driven by the law. Paul talks about the law in Galatians, and really I appreciate to, to take a look, and this is really coming out of the text for today. Paul tells us we are in, the, the, the law is used to imprison us. It's interesting, Paul says, the law imprisoned you and it's your guardian. I, I don't consider those two to go together. But what is the purpose of the law? And Paul talks about earlier. What is the purpose of the law? What do you think the purpose of the law is? How do you use the law in your life? For those of you who know, I come from a mission background and we speak it very differently. So when I ask a question, I'm not a rhetorical question. What is the purpose of the law for you? If you can answer. What's the purpose of the law for you? Right and wrong. To know what's right and wrong. Yeah? What else? For protection, yes. I, we talk about that the law puts a, a hedge. Don't go there or you're going to be in trouble. Anything else? Hmm? Hold. Order. order, yes, it provides order. And, and Martin Luther talks about the left-hand kingdom, that the law provides something for which our governments can use to provide order for our communities, right? And, and to protect one another, right? Don't kill one another. Don't steal from one another. Don't lie. These things are not good, and they will not be good for the community for which we came. Paul's principal use of the law, and I'm going to say it is a diagnostic tool. I'm going to be a little bit like my African brothers and sisters, even though I'm not African. And they would say, I want you all to say that. Diagnostic tool. The law is a diagnostic tool. So what did he mean by that? Well, the law tells us where we're messing up. And what does a diagnostic tool do? What does a diagnostic tool do? So if you have an MRI machine and you run the person through the MRI machine, what, what will the MRI machine tell you? It will tell you what's wrong with you. This is the purpose Paul talks about the law. It will tell you what's wrong for you. Now, there's a civil use, which is keeping order, but it's, it's actually to tell you, you have messed up. That's the purpose of the law. It tells you you have messed up. You were supposed to do these things. This is how you're supposed to live, and this is how you're supposed to live in community, and you have messed up. Now, if, you, if the MRI machine tells you, and I'm going to use in particular, I'm going to just pick on, if it tells you you have cancer, and there's a reason why I choose that particular illness, because I think it kind of says the nature of sin. It is cells gone wrong. It's our own cells gone wrong, and that's kind of the nature of sin. It's our own cells feeding against ourselves and causing... So if the MRI machine tells you you have cancer, do you run them through the MRI machine again? It, 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 will that help cure them? No. I mean, if we run them through 10 times, will that help cure them? No. Why? Is the MRI machine made to cure them? It's a diagnostic machine. And how many of us use the law like something to cure people? Oh, you should be like this. You should act like this. We even do that with our kids. And you know what? We do it a fair bit in church, too. Oh, if you were only like this. We do it when we're in coffee time. And you know what my struggle is if we come out of this whole issue with Central Asia is sometimes people say, Oh, those people are the bad people. Look at how they enforce their rules on other people. And I'm going, yeah, we do it too. Because it's the nature of the law and sin. When we mesh them together, we try to make other people, and we say, you should keep the law like I do. You should be as fervent in your devotion to God as I am. And we point our fingers, and we become, well, in New Testament language, we become Pharisees. In modern day language, we become Taliban. And it's interesting because the Taliban, we, we were doing with the security reports, and the Taliban 
immediately, or within a month after they were taken over, we were talking to people who were involved in the country, and the Taliban were having trouble with ISIS. Because the ISIS people said, Taliban, you're not serious enough about your belief. So yeah, so the ISIS people were blowing up cell phone towers or whatever, and they said, because you have to be more serious. You have to be more diligent. You have to go through and cleanse people's homes, literally go from home to home, which they did. And some of the Taliban, some of the Taliban who were doing this, I'm sorry I have to be there, but I'm told that I have to do it. And they go home and say, just tell them I've been there. And others ripped homes apart. But it's the nature of actually what's in us. We can do that. We sometimes go people's, through people's homes in our head and say, oh, they're kind of a Christian, or they're not really a Christian, and they're kind of... And we want to use the law to fix them. And that's not the nature of the law. In fact, when we use the law to fix them, we do more harm. We do more harm. And in fact, we try to fix them by making them more like us. And the trouble is, when we look at our own lives, we're going, I'm not that good of a person. So what is the gospel message? What is the message that we speak? We had a young couple who went to Albania to meet the Afghan refugees. And they're ministering to them, and they're ministering to them in their brokenness. What speaks life? What's the gospel message here? The gospel message is that I can't fix myself, and I most certainly can't fix Pastor Janelle or Anita, even though I'm quite convinced sometimes I think I can. <laughs> Anita's my wife, if you haven't picked that up. Husbands, do you ever try to fix your wife? And when she's not listening, we just get louder? <laughs> and it doesn't work? Or do you try to fix your husband or your kids? So what is the gospel message? The gospel message is, and you know where... I think probably the best organization who's figured it out is actually AA. Because the first thing is, I am powerless by myself. I have a problem, and I'm powerless by myself to fix it. Second, there is a power that is powerful and can fix it. And the third one is, I will surrender myself to this power. And the power is actually very clearly made present in the person of Jesus. This is different than any other religious practice belief, and it's often quite different than even what we practice in our own churches. We practice in our churches, usually it's often it feels like you need to be like this, and we put more monkeys on people's backs, quite literally. I mean, Jesus talks about it to the Pharisees. He says, you, who are you to practice, and who are you to tell people how to run. He says, you go for a, a hundred miles or a thousand miles to make a proselyte and you make him more a son of hell than he was before because you put more demons on our back because you say, you've got to be like this, you've got to be like this. And he says, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying until I don't even know my own name anymore. I'm powerless. I have a problem and I try to fix it and I can't. The law has diagnosed me. I'm sick, and it's eating me from the inside out, quite literally. And as bad as those people are, I'm sicker. And I lose myself a little bit more and more each day. And I'm powerless. And the good news is there's a God who loves you, who has come in the person of Jesus, who has cast out, who has lifted off the thousand monkeys off your back, and this is the message we go to pro proclaim, regardless of race, regardless of religious practice, regardless of culture, because every culture has problems. Every culture. And every culture has beautiful things in it. But Jesus comes along and says, I've lifted the monkeys off your back, so you don't have to be like Charles. You can be like the one whom God has made you. You can be in your culture and be beautiful and be made whole. Because God, who has loved you, has taken the monkeys off your back. And we say, I surrender to you. This is the message that we come to proclaim to a world that is broken. 
Do not look at your neighbor and say, hmm, I know how to fix him. And I do it. Even I do it. Catch yourself and say, sorry, that's my 1002 button, which is to remind me, Luke 10, 2, for the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Pray therefore to the Lord of the harvest. So Lord, we pray for workers, for our global workers. We pray for them to be empowered not to change people, but I'm thinking of the ascension message, but to be a witness to you and how you come to set people free. Our job is not to be perfect. Our job is not to be perfect. Our job is to admit that the law has diagnosed us and we can't fix ourselves. One little story to finish this, and it's actually not even a mission story, it's a Charles story. For those of you who know, before Anita and I got married, my father had a head injury, a brain injury accident. He was working on scaffolding, painting the roof of his shop, and he fell over backwards, landed on his head, 12 feet off the ground. Head injury. He's in the hospital, no response. The, the doctors are saying, what do you want to do to keep him alive? Do you want to be aggressive or do you not? And we're struggling as a family. Into the midst of this, the John Deere dealership guy comes in and he says, Charles, if any man deserves to get healed, it's your father. And me being a young seminarian who had just finished and he says, well, if anybody's got to what they deserve. And he says, no, you need to hear. If any man deserves it, it's your father. And the Lord kind of spoke to me. He says, Charles, listen to the guy. He's trying to tell you something. I say, why do you say that? He said, Charles, your father was not always the nicest farmer who came into my dealership. Sometimes he would come in and he would, be, he would say, you can't do that, that's unfair, this is, and he'd make my life miserable. But your father was the only man who would come back the next day and say, you know what, what I did yesterday was wrong and I am sorry, please forgive me. And that was the witness that spoke to him about what a, person of God walks like. Not in perfection, but in humility. And that spoke to him how he would live in the community where he works with, with the workers he works with. This is the message which Jesus says, return home and declare how much God has done for you. Look at one another, just around here. God has made them unique and beautiful. Do you want them to walk into the fullness in your midst? Do we want the folks who aren't here to know that they are free to be everything God has designed for them? Yes. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for us so that they will know God wants to do it for them. Amen. Shout to our 
God who gave us the Spirit. Oh, shout to our God who gave us the Spirit. Oh, shout to our God who gave us the Spirit. Oh, sing to our God. Oh, sing to our God. For Jesus is Lord. Amen. Alleluia. For Jesus is Lord. Amen. Alleluia. For Jesus is Lord. Amen. Alleluia. Sing to our God. Oh, sing to our God. People of God, I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we profess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. You hear the cries of those who seek you. Equip your church with missionaries and evangelists who reveal the continuous call of your outstretched hands and your promises of a home in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You water the earth and send sunshine to grow the crops. Bring renewed hope to the land as we are called to be your stewards. Continue to bring restoration following the storms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who are marginalized or cast out. On this Juneteenth observance, guide us continually toward the end of oppression in all its forms. Bring freedom and human flourishing to all your beloved children, especially those in Ukraine and other war-torn areas of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who suffer. Come to the aid of all who are homeless, naked, hungry, and sick especially the names we have been entrusted to pray for. Benjamin, Lloyd, and Zoe, Kathy, Terry, and Grant, Posey, Darlene, and Jill. Bring peace to any experiencing mental illness or addiction that they can clearly recognize your loving presence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who celebrate and those who grieve on this Father's Day. Nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships. Accompany those who wish to be fathers and open us to receive your nurturing love from all who serve fathering roles in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful departed whose lives proclaimed all you had done for them. At the last, unite us with them as we make our home in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Please greet your neighbors with a verbal peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. 
invite you to be seated when you are ready. A few community announcements and opportunities to serve to be lifted up. Um, we mentioned last Sunday that we now have those cemetery fund envelopes available in the back, on the back table, um, to give as your heart uh, is stirred in the uh, needs for the continued cleanup and also in the future of the replacement of so many of the trees that were lost in the Memorial Day storm. Um, so you can find those in the back, as I mentioned. Next Sunday evening, uh, June 26th, we have our first fellowship night of the year um, out on the back lawn of the church from about 7 to 9 p.m. or however long people hang around. Um, there's outdoor games, there's s'mores, and if you were not here last year, the grasshopper s'more is fantabulous. So, so good. I'm so looking forward to that one. But there are a couple of other options. We invite you to come. It's for all ages. Children are welcome, of course. Um, but there's all kinds of things that will be happening. Just come and gather and spend some time together. And usually, it's been so lovely because there's been a nice breeze that comes right off the lake. And so we're going to harness that wind that night for a delightful evening. Um, also, in the uh, uh, announcement portion of the bulletin, there is an article for our monthly World Hunger Appeal. The um, envelopes are also on the back uh, table itself. Read through that article, nicely written, and thank you so much for, for submitting and putting that in for us every month. If you haven't heard, somebody's turning 50. I don't know, about 50. We'll see how it goes, but... Next Friday at the Jonathan and Carolyn Olson um, uh, farm site, we're going to celebrate this 50 thing for me. Um, there is still a place to sign up out in the gathering space if you're able to come, even if it's just to stop by for a few minutes. Um, there's going to be all kinds of outdoor games, there's going to be food, there's going to be music, there's just going to be all kinds of fun and fabulous fellowship for this fabulous 50 I've heard about. So uh, let's uh, join and gather together as you are able to. The uh, Christ in Our Home devotional books for July, August, and September are on that back table as well. There's at least one or two large print ones. If we run out of those, I have some more in the office that we can pull out. So grab those, share those with your friends, those nice little daily devotions um, to keep us uh, grounded during the week in between our gatherings together. And as usual, thank you so much for your generosity, the ways that you share your lives with the church itself. At this time, the ushers will receive the Lord's offering.
invite you to rise in body or spirit. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. I invite you to be seated and the ushers will direct you forward. Jesus. 
Jesus crucified. In this blood there is healing. In this cup is life forever. In this moment by the Spirit Christ is with Satisfy the hungry heart with gift of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to eat. As when the shepherd calls his sheep, they know and heed his voice. So
and receive the communion blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds of sin and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.